Father, as we gather in this place, as we gather online, Lord, we come here to hear from your word. We come here to worship you with our lives, Lord, and we ask that you would be with us this evening, that you would be at work in us, in our hearts, um, and Lord, just yeah, be at work in the words that Tim has to say to us this evening, um, be at work changing us, that our lives would be lives of, of worship unto you, Lord. Um, so yeah, be at work in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, well, what are we doing this term in our group? That's the uh, that's the question we're going to we're going to start off with. Uh, well, most of our Bible talk series on Sunday evenings tend to be uh, what we'd call expositional. And by that I mean series that take a particular book of the Bible and work through it, with each talk taking the main point of the Bible passage as its main point. And that's intentional. We want to be shaped by God's priorities. And so, you know, we believe that what he says is important and that kind of um, avoids us just missing out parts of God's word we don't find comfortable or whatever else. Having said that, every now and then, I think it's valuable to have a topical series. So to take a particular theme or idea from the Bible and consider um, different passages and consider what the whole story of scripture has to say about it. And as I said at the beginning, uh, this term at Jerry Street 630, we're doing a series called The Gospel Unpacked. And so we're taking eight themes or topics, uh, art and culture, work, sex, food, gossip, social justice, success, and authority. And for each one, we're thinking about how the gospel, that is the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done, uh, how, how the gospel changes our attitudes towards it. So we're not just interested in what the Bible has to say about each topic, although that's of course important, but over the course of all eight talks, as we let the gospel kind of soak into our spiritual bones as it were, I hope we'll get practiced at thinking this way about every area of life. Now, let's, let's pray again uh, just before we start. Will you, will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how relevant it is to every area of life. And thank you for what you have to say to us tonight. We pray right now that by your spirit, you'd come and speak to us, to each of us, although we are only kind of virtually gathered. 
uh, we pray that you would speak nonetheless and that we might be changed and encouraged and challenged by your word tonight. Amen. Right, so tonight we've, we've come to think about uh, the topic of the gospel and sex. Now, the first question is, why did I pick sex to be one of the topics? Well, two reasons, really. Firstly, because it's such a huge part of our culture and society, isn't it? Uh, it's seemingly everywhere. Movies, books, corner shops, music. Uh, sex sells perfume, it sells cars, it sells clothes. Uh, it even sells bank accounts. Um, but second, sex is a big part of the biblical story. After the intro on the general cultural mandate of Genesis 1, the next three topics in our series are work last week, sex this week, and food next week. And I chose these three to start because they are the first three things given to Adam and Eve in the garden at the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, if you've got a Bible with you there, it'd be great, be useful for you to have that open. I uh, just want to start by rereading Genesis 1, 28. I read that to you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm just going to read it to you again to remind you. Genesis 1 verse 28 says this, And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every other living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So, and if you saw them that there, work, sex, and food, they're all there right at the start, and they're all good gifts from God. But they're also all abused by us. And I think actually you might make a very good case for how those three things are some of the three most abused or worshipped gifts that God has given us. Now, as a side note, there's also authority there in Genesis 1, but I'm, we're leaving that to the end of term for a good reason. But, but here's the question. How is sex abused in our society? Well, perhaps a better question would be how isn't sex abused in our society? Um, you know, straight away, various things come to mind. Pornography, child abuse, rape. Every year, two to three million women are trafficked with around two thirds forced into prostitution. About one in five marriages in the UK suffers from infertility. Cheating in non-married relationships, much higher still. Uh, all over society, we have partners left heartbroken, families broken and divided, children left with scars that will never fully heal or wondering where their dad's gone. Um, and these, you know, I hate to start in, a, in a, such a sobering way. These are statistics and numbers, aren't they? But the reality is that, whether directly or indirectly, the majority of us here have been, or probably will be at some point, affected in some way by this kind of abuse of God's gift, which is tragic, but there it is. But it goes deeper than the obvious too, doesn't it? Because the devastating truth to get our hearts around this evening is that all of us in some way have abused God's good gift of sex. Every single one of us, there is no sexually uh, pure and whole person here tonight. So consider what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five. He said this, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now you might think that's, that's pretty strict. Um, this isn't talking about me because maybe I'm not married, I can't commit adultery. But if you think that, that would be to miss Jesus's point. Jesus is taking human sexual brokenness and he's saying, look, the, the deepest issue with something like adultery is not legal or even physical. It's spiritual. The problem lies in your hearts, everyone's hearts. We have all taken a good gift and we have made it about us. Now, as a culture, we, we chase after sex, don't we? Right, it's held up as something that, that to be a whole human being, to be you know, totally normal and whole you need to be having sex regularly and spectacularly but but we've all we all use sex in a host of different ways in our hearts um, so people with mundane or boring lives full of work or serving others they might look to sex as their hope or to pornography or something as a release something that they deserve to have in their lives 
People who suffer times of hardship sometimes look to sex as their hope, thinking it can be their refuge, take their mind off things or to um, you know, feel valued. People who are frustrated or angry at life sometimes misuse sex as a control thing over others or for revenge even. And people who are lonely might look to sex uh, or relationships that hold it to provide a feeling of being wanted and needed. Here's a particularly big one though, uh, although as I've said, people use in all sorts of different ways. In our society, sex is used for self-fulfillment and pleasure seeking. So let's, uh, let's think on the four Ps. We've chatted about a few times already this term. A couple of weeks ago I said, um, you can kind of identify the story of anything in the world with four Ps. So, so P1 is purpose. Many in our society today would say that my purpose is freedom and pleasure. You know, the, the Nike saying, just do it. If it feels good, do it. Um, P number two is problem. And my problem, many think, is that I'm therefore shackled, whether it be by religious or traditional views, whatever it is, I'm held back from being all that I could be, you know, by, by having freedom and, and pleasure in what I do. Uh, last week, someone in this group showed me a music video by Kesha. I'd not seen it before, but, but it's, it's basically, uh, the video shows some kind of weird satanic orgy taking place in a barn. And then uh, the, the, very, uh, the implication, I guess, is that they're renegade, pleasure-seeking freedom fighters, because it ends with the police, you know, traditional authority figures, the police show up and shoot everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you've not seen it, I wouldn't rush. It's about as great as it sounds. Uh, but but that, that's the idea. It's about kind of fighting against the, the shackles of traditionalism. P number three, what do we imagine our hope is then? Well, says this idea, we remove sex from its shackles, we enjoy it, we seek it, we do it freely. So goes the free love ideal. We say that as long as it's consensual and it's safe, then it's all good. The more the merrier. And then P number four, the promise of using sex like this is uh, great satisfaction and pleasure and self-fulfillment for everyone. But is it true? That's the question. Can sex, free with anyone and everyone, really fulfill that promise? Well, the Bible wants to say no, it can't. If we treat sex like that, then it won't make us whole. In fact, it will leave us broken. And it has, hasn't it? We have a broken society of fatherless kids and immature men and insecure women. Uh, if you want to, if you have a Bible there, this is passage we'll spend most of this evening in. I want you to turn to Ephesians 5 with me, because there's a particular verse there that is of uh, great interest to us as we think through this topic. I'd love to look, look at that with you for a few minutes. It's verse 32, Ephesians 5. Uh, but I'm going to read a little bit around it just to give us the context. But, but look up Ephesians 5. And we'll read from verse 25. Here it is, Ephesians 5, verse 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Do you see the link Paul makes here in this passage? So he, he quotes Genesis uh, 1 and verse 31. And he says that when the first man and woman were given to each other as, as one flesh, that, uh, that that most intimate of all human relationships within a marriage, it's not for its own sake. The reason two people should get married is not because they can somehow complete one another or because they found Mr. and Mrs. Wright. No, verse 31, when, when, he, when he talks about Genesis 1, when man and woman were first given to each other and told to go make babies, he says, verse 32, that this is a picture. It's a picture of Christ and the church. 
Marriage and sex were created by God to be a picture, to be a drama of Jesus, Jesus Christ's faithful, intimate and self-giving love for his people, us, the church. And what does that mean? Well, think back to the four P's story we, we tell ourselves about sex. Is sex's purpose to bring us pleasure? Well, yes, but not primarily or even secondarily. And is the problem I have that religious values somehow hold me back from having lots of good sex and my fulfillment? Well, not at all. See, the Bible doesn't have too small a view of sex. We have too small a view of sex. We mess around with it as if it's just some physical thing good for the moment. But God tells us to understand sex the way it was intended. God made it good, says Genesis. And there is an entire several chapter long poem about sex and romance in the Bible. The Bible isn't a spoiled sport anti-sex book. But at the same time, we also make too much of sex. While we are just fawning over it and worshipping it in our hearts, we've missed the point that God made sex as a signpost. A signpost pointing to something far bigger and more glorious beyond the momentary union of two people. He made it to a point to the eternal spiritual union that he holds out for us. 20th century writer C.S. Lewis puts it like this. This is one of my favourite all-time quotes. He says this, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. The Bible says something very similar. Uh, this is a quote from Jeremiah chapter two. Uh, God says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken systems that cannot hold water. This is why we're sexually broken, individually and, uh, and as a society, he says God, because we've turned away from what God intended and we've made sex about us and our fulfillment. Look, this, this idea plays out in sex itself too, because relationship is fundamental to sex. Here's a general principle that I'll propose. Uh, the better the relationship, the better the sex. The better the relationship, the better the sex. Let me give you a few examples. So let's start at the very bottom where you find the worst kind of sex. Deeply negative relationships, uh, if you stop to think about it for a second, always produce terrible sex. For example, relationships of abuse, or perhaps a contrived relationship based on money, like prostitution or porn. Uh, porn, for example, lies to you. It's all lit right, it's framed right, it's two people supposedly having a great time. But think about it, just off the screen, there are a couple of guys holding lighting equipment, there's a director, there's a camera guy. Um, both porn actors are probably on a ton of drugs to numb their minds, what's going on, so they won't remember it. And statistically, one of them is probably sex trafficked to be there in the first place. Now, as you stop and think about what's going on, it's not only horrific, it's awkward, and, and and not pleasant at all. Um, just above negative relationships then, you also get sex within a very minimal relationship. So imagine like a one night stand. And that's also a lie. Sorry, Hollywood. The idea of two attractive people meeting in a bar for the first time and having great, not at all awkward sex is just totally stupid. Um, that's not how it works. And what about the other end of the spectrum? So, so where do you find the best sex of all then, if not in these places? Well, the best sex comes with the best relationships because sex is designed um, <laughs> sex is designed to be well sticky it's designed as relational glue that's how it's designed now, it's, the best sex is in a long-term relationship where both partners are comfortable with each other and right at the top therefore is within marriage where two people have legally committed to being faithful to each other that gives it a lot of security it takes away, or it should, the need to try and impress each other or worry about, about being embarrassed together. 
you have the best sex by getting married, actually. Not society doesn't believe that, but that's the case. And by being married for decades. But here, here's the important point. Um, when I say the better the relationship, I don't mean in a generic way or just by you know, meeting, meeting Mr. and Mrs. Wright or meeting someone who completes you in some kind of way. No, no, no. Look again at Ephesians 5. Look at what kind of ultimate relationship that sex is pointing to. Marriage and the intimacy therein points us to an eternal husband who is, verse 29, totally committed to our good. Verse 27, totally faithful to his good purposes for us. And verse 25, totally self-sacrificial. He gave up his own body for us. That's the kind of better relationship that I'm talking about. Not a kind of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. Total self-giving and self-sacrifice. That's what, that's what a marriage, um, intimate relationship should look like. And actually, despite the lies of movies and porn websites where it's all about power, Sex is designed to work well when both people are other seeking, focused on bringing the other pleasure and not thinking about themselves. So even if you're married, that means sex can get broken. Uh, people getting married just to have sex or using a spouse within a marriage for their own purposes or when a marriage relationship turns into what I'm owed or what I need or what I can get, then sex can get broken. It happens all the time to, to married couples. It doesn't work. But the gospel comes along and radically changes our perspective. When we see the bigger reality, the bigger truth that we've been being pointed to by sex this whole time, it changes us. This is the last question I'm going to look at, and this is going to be um, reasonably brief. And then we're going to read this together in groups shortly. So there'll be time to look at this in more detail. But turn with me now to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll just show you a couple of things there as we finish. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 12. <clears throat> Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12. Says this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have, been, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So Paul has heard of these Corinthian Christians who are visiting prostitutes. And what does he say to them? Verse 14, he says, this is weird. Think about the resurrection. That's what he thinks, says to them. He effectively says, think on the new life you have in Christ. Because if sex is meant to be pointing us to the faithful, self-sacrificial love of our Lord, then dwell on that. Because in the gospel, here's what you've been given. You've been given union with Christ. All the goodness and kindness and love of our good shepherd is yours now. Verse 20, you've been bought by him. Verse 15, you've been made members with him. You've been made one with him. You've been attached to the glory and wonder of Christ himself. That's what's happened to you. So verse 17, his spirit now dwells in you. You have an intimacy with him. He is your ultimate fulfillment and pleasure and joy. Sex cannot give you that, but Christ can. 
Verse 19, your body is now like the Old Testament temple, the temple where God was present, but the people were separated from him. Well, you've been brought inside now, right inside the Holy of Holies of the temple, one with Christ, with every spiritual blessing in him. Paul says you've got to get your head around this, all that you've been given. Why would you go to a prostitute to try and receive some some aspect of this when you've got it all already? Uniting yourself to prostitute, given all these new spiritual realities, Paul says, is just deeply against who you are now. Let me finish with a story uh, to kind of illustrate this. Have you ever heard of sirens? I don't mean police sirens. I mean uh, the sirens, the monsters from Greek mythology. Well, sirens basically were, were ugly and disgusting and terrifying um, in and of themselves. What they did was they used to sit on rocks by the sea and they would sing to passing sailors. And the singing was so beautiful that when the sailors would look out and see them, instead of seeing gross evil monsters, they'd see beautiful women singing to them from the rocks. And they'd instantly fall in love and they'd jump overboard and they'd swim out to the siren. Uh, only to find a hideous monster who would tear them apart and eat them. And lots of sailors tried different things in the stories to get past the sirens, like tying themselves to the ship mast or putting wax in their ears, uh, different things they would do to try and block out um, the sirens. But the sirens are a little bit like pornography or sexual morality, sin generally even. They look more appealing than they are, and they will only eat us up. And we can sometimes act like those sailors, just trying to stop ourselves um, from from going to it. Maybe you've heard the story of Jason and the Argonauts, or at least heard of it. Uh, Jason knew his ship would have to sail past these sirens, but he had a plan. And as the ship passed by the sirens, the sirens began to sing out to lure the sailors on board towards them. But Jason and his sailors didn't even bat an eyelid. Do you know why? because on board Jason's ship was the most talented musician in the whole land, a musician called Orpheus. And as they sailed past, Jason had Orpheus play his instrument. And so the sailors didn't even care about the siren song because they were so enjoying and captivated by the beautiful music that Orpheus was playing on deck. Well, Philippians 4 verse eight says this, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Here's the call of tonight. When we're tempted to get lured into our broken way of thinking about and using and abusing sex, whatever that looks like for us, for our own gratification, at the expense of others, well, look past the good gift itself and look to where it's pointing. It's pointing you to Christ and to what God offers you in Christ and all the goodness and sweetness that is ours in him. And let that spur us to self-sacrificial purity and service of others rather than feeling the need to, to use them or treat them as objects for our own sake. Let me end just by saying that, you know, this, this talk has been um, no doubt as awkward to hear as it has been to give in some ways. And if you want to chat about anything to do with this topic, then please just message me. Um, because these things thrive in the dark. Satan loves to lie to you and tell you that you are the only one who is broken in this area. But it's not true. And listen, I'm not, I'm not squeamish. You're unlikely to shock me with things that I haven't heard similar from someone else before. Um, so message me or one of your mini community leaders and let's talk about these things and let's get them in the open and chat these things through with someone. Uh, right now, let, let's pray and then Graham's going to gonna, uh, lead us in another song. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray for all of my brothers and sisters here because this is an issue that um, it's, it's so obvious in our culture and society around us that we are very aware of the temptations are very aware of our brokenness and our and our failures and our sadnesses um, at times when we have both um, not done things rightly and also when we've been treated badly as well and father i know this is a topic that for many people here this is 
are therefore a hard one. And so, Father, I want to um, I want to pray that you would come by your Spirit now, and you would not allow anything that's been said to to rise unhelpful temptations. Would you get rid of anything that's been said that is unhelpful? But Father, would you please, by your Spirit through the Gospel of Power, would you transform our hearts and minds so that we might love Christ and the things we have in Him more, and um, and treat sex rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to hand back over to Graham, uh, and he's going to lead us in another song. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, as Tim was speaking, um, I decided to change the song that I was going to sing as the second song. So I put lyrics in the chat for Be Thou My Vision. Um, so we'll go for that and hopefully my voice will hold whilst we sing it. So let's sing together. thanks for what Tim shared this evening, for the the difficult space that he has stepped into there in the call to to sexual purity, Lord. And um, we pray that where this is a battle, we pray that we would seek for help and ask for help and, um, and run to you, Lord. Um, that our lives would be marked by setting our eyes upon you, by setting our vision upon you, Lord. Um, yeah, that, that we would understand the gospel call to towards sexual purity, Lord. Um, and that we would see in you um, 
the va a greater value and a greater truth and a greater love. Um, yeah, that 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 we would rejoice in this gift that you have given us, um, appropriately, Lord, um, and that we would, yeah, just just live with you, um, as a center of our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, uh, thank you, Graham, um, for leading us in some songs tonight. Well, what we're going to do now is break off into some groups. So if you've come along so far this term, you'll know that we, we kind of split the, the overall community of young adults into four kind of mini communities, just so we have a little bit more focus of how we look after each other and help each other keep growing at this time we're a bit more separated. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've just been putting us all into our... Uh, normal groups and if you're new and joining us then uh, it'd be great to be able to get to know you a little bit better in, in smaller groups as well and uh yeah we'll have a bit of chance to chat through that one corinthians 6 passage as well so i'm going to go ahead and open the groups now and uh, we'll we'll come back together at the end uh, about eight o'clock um so we'll be a chance to pray together in the groups as well so i'm going to open them up now um enjoy Welcome back everyone. I hope your time in your groups was a good time to chat together and to, um, hopefully have a better time to pray together and um, just yeah chat a bit through more of this issue. Um, just just want to finish by saying a couple of things. Um, one is just rereading a couple of verses from uh, one of the passages we looked at tonight. This is Ephesians 5 um, verse 25. Just to reread these few verses just to finish on this. I want this to be the last thing we think in here. Uh, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that's us, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church, that's us, to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Just want to finish by um, just encouraging us that, you know, this is a, this is a difficult issue and uh, it brings up all sorts of um, feelings and thoughts, but just to, just to be really clear as we finish, um, what Christ has done for us, he has died on the cross for his people so that whatever um, sin, whatever um, abuse they've done or suffered, that all of those things might be washed clean um, by what he has done. So let's just let's just let that be what we finish and dwell on that. And um, whatever kind of thoughts or feelings this, this night potentially heavy has brought up, I know that in Christ you are... Um, you are holy and without blemish. Even if that doesn't feel like the reality, that is our reality in Christ. Uh, so I want to encourage you with that. The other thing I want to just say is every week so far this time I've been recommending a book that goes along with the topic. Um, some of you, this might not be a surprise which book I've chosen this week. Uh, this is uh, Captured by a Better Vision by Tim Chester, Living Porn Free. Um, regardless whether porn specifically is something you struggle with in this area, this book would be really helpful for you. I've got a ton of notes down the side of it because this book is kind of my go-to if I ever chat with anyone um, who is struggling with this issue at the minute. Um, I found it really, really useful as well in the past um, for myself and just, um, yeah, just really recommend it. It goes through lots of things we chat about tonight, different um, reasons people might struggle in this area and, and encourages us with the gospel. So um, pick that up if this is um, something you'd like to think about more. Uh, next week, we'll be thinking about the topic of the gospel and food thinking through another area of life in, in a similar way, thinking about how the gospel interacts with our attitude towards things. Um, so, uh, yeah, come along next time. And do use the week ahead. Um, don't just kind of come on a Sunday night, but uh, be in touch with the people in your group, encourage each other, um, pray for each other, um, and, you know, meet up for walks or whatever you want to do in, in, as well. Uh, but uh, from me, um, good night, and thanks for joining us tonight, and see you all soon.